Hello my dears, as of right now my light is still broken, I hope you're enjoying that saga. Um, today we're going to talk about relaxed performances because every time I talk about how I'm frustrated with the inaccessibility of theater and performance I immediately am told, but what about those ones that like they make special for the autistic people or whatever? Why can't you just like go to those instead? And then I have to explain the long list of reasons as to why. No. Um, so today we're going to talk about how cool and important relaxed performances are, what they are, how they work, and also how they're not really at all the solution to our issues. And I'm tired of people telling me that they are. Also, if you're new here, hi there, hello! My name is Sydney, my pronouns are they, them. I am currently um, directing the world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. I'm also a composer for a new musical involving disability, so I do a lot of work around accessible theater um, as well as accessible education and literally anything else that I find even vaguely interesting enough to research and then make a video on. Um, so welcome if you're new and thanks for coming back if you're not and if you want to hang around you're super welcome to. But let's get into it. So relaxed performances began as a concept in 2011 when Jess Tom, the creator of Tourette's Hero, went to see a show in the UK and at intermission the theater manager asked her to move and sit for the rest of the show in the sound booth because other members of the audience were complaining about her verbal and physical tics during the show, which they claimed were a distraction. Obviously, she was super embarrassed and upset by the experience, and that motivated her to write her show Backstage in Biscuitland. Um, it won tons of awards in 2014. I will include an incredible interview about it in the description for you to check out. I love her so much and I want to be her friend. But anyway, she came up with the idea of a relaxed performance where tics were not an issue and people who needed to move a lot could do so, and lots of people who never felt welcome in the theater were able to go and walk watch a live performance. It was the same stage, the same set, the same actors, the same price as professional theater for typical audiences. The social norms were just a little bit different and the sensory aspects were solvent. We're gonna get into the particulars of how they go about that in a little bit. And the idea, well, it really took off. Relaxed performances go by many names, most common besides relaxed being autism friendly or sensory friendly, um, but language is changing and people are realizing that autism friendly excludes everybody else who might need relaxed performances, so it's more unifying into sensory friendly or relaxed performances. This movement has been really, really cool to watch. It's very recent, obviously, and it raised a lot of awareness and understanding about learning, intellectual, and developmental disabilities. It's also expanded to include baby and toddler-friendly performances, which I think is super cool and super, super important. It's been shifting how we look at theater and theater culture. I mean, the title Relaxed Performance alone makes you realize how not relaxed and how gate-kept mainstream theater typically is. It is such an important creation and it has made theater going possible for so many Many more people than it ever has before. So let us talk about the structure. Now before the day of the show, often weeks before, ushers and theater staff go through a form of training and they also regularly will retrain throughout the year in order to run these kinds of performances because it does take a specific skill set. They learn how to answer various questions, how to handle various needs, and they're equipped to work with a large mass of disabled people. Do I think that they should do this training regularly because disabled people attend the theater at all other times? We, they just pay less attention to us because usually the disabled people that come are really old people? Maybe, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. The point is the staff go through a training in order to make sure things are as organized as possible because things can get pretty chaotic pretty quickly when you have a lot of different access needs. They also know to expect more families and more children in the audience and work to guarantee accessible spots for wheelchair users, people who use mobility devices, and their companions, as well as space for guide dogs and service animals. There's also a lot of communication between the house staff, those are the people that work in the house, which is like the the theater, um, the performers and the production team to figure out how they can make the show and environment more relaxed and what things they may need to do to expect or pay attention to. Theaters that do not typically have reserved seating, for example, will typically reserve seating um, for relaxed performances to make sure families and care teams can all sit next to each other. Um, and it's common for no or low cost tickets to be available for somebody's companion or caregiver. And also, side thing, um, disabled people who go to Disney World also have the same setup. Um, so if I get a medical note from my doctor saying that I'm autistic, my carer or the one person that I bring with me can get into Disney for free. Fun facts to know. I'm gonna try that one time and then I'm gonna make a video about it so that you can all experience. Yeah, I really, but the pandemic is still a thing so I'm not comfortable going to Disney yet, but I will sometime. Anyway, 
that was a digression. Before the show, members of the house staff or production team will go on stage and explain the norms for a relaxed performance, tell them what to expect in the show and within social norms, um, give any trigger warnings as may needed, and point out any resources that are available to patrons if they need them. The audience is allowed to move in and out of the room during the performance as needed. They are allowed to move or make noise as they need to. They're allowed to bring in food and drink. There is typically a quiet and or sensory space available for those who may need it. Um, the difference between a quiet space and a sensory space is sensory spaces usually have like sensory things to look at, to touch, to feel, etc. but they can also be combined as the same thing. Some places will make available sensory bags or sensory kits with fidget toys for people to borrow during the show and headphones. And they'll also add basic accommodations like sign language interpretation, closed caption devices, and headsets with audio description services for blind and low vision people. Visual stories beforehand are common. Those are documents that are usually online as a PDF so you can print it out if you wanted to. Um, and they talk you through every aspect of what to expect. It will show you where to park, where to enter, where you will go once you enter, what your seat might look like, what snacks might be available to you, um, the story of the show and what to expect and trigger warnings for that, where the bathrooms and quiet areas are, um, who to ask for various things if you need help. They'll also often include like, here's what you might like to wear or what people typically wear in these situations and a description of the social norms of the space so that you can know what to expect. For my show, um, we have been making visual stories for our actors. We made one for auditions, we're gonna make another one for the first rehearsal and we're gonna make one for tech week and for performance days as well so that they know what to expect and then we're gonna make one for the audience as well. It's pretty easy to make them. It can make a very, very huge difference to anybody who might've been too anxious to come and now they know what to expect so they actually feel comfortable coming. Some shows will also often have a pre-show tactile tour for blind and low vision folks to go touch things that may be used on stage or have more time to just experience the space. And then the most obvious changes, the lighting of the show will be adjusted to be less dramatic, specifically avoiding spotlights on the audience and cutting strobe lights, flashing or moving lights as those can trigger seizures and migraines for people. The house lights are often left on at a low level so that you feel less like you're like plunged into the dark. Um, the volume level will go down a little bit. Stage smoke and fog are usually removed if they were in the show to begin with and scents are reduced or eliminated if those were also involved in the production. It's a very, very big deal. Um, it takes a lot of effort, obviously, and therefore shows usually only do one or two relaxed performances a run. For example, Broadway shows will do one a year and that's it. Um, and that brings us to the issues with them. First of all, if you need to go to a relaxed performance and you can't make it to the one or two a year that they're doing, you cannot go see that show. You have no other choice. Most shows, especially Broadway ones, as I already said, will do one a year. Wicked and Lion King do only one a year. So if you wanted to see those and you're not available that day, you can't see it. Also, most shows that do relaxed performances are ones specifically aimed at children, which is awesome and amazing and important. But also, what is the point in nurturing a love of theater and children if there isn't work for them to see as adults? Because people who need relaxed performances are also adults. Um, first of all, because disabled children grow up to be disabled adults and also just because adults need them. Um, and we wanna see shows with more grit and depth and darker content and creators forget that, which means that I will never be able to see or be in a rock musical. And not that I necessarily care about rock musicals, but the fact that I had to give up the ticket I already had to see a non-binary person perform in Jagged Little Pill in the national tour still frustrates me. And that brings in the discussion of segregation. In an arts professional article I read, they said, relaxed performances suggest this group of people is considered to be other. They also offer audiences who prefer not to experience theater in the company of groups of people unlike themselves, an opportunity to elect to do so. And I'm not sure how comfortable we should be with that idea, which I, firmly agree with, especially because you can make a show like visually as accessible as you want, but most theaters themselves aren't accessible to begin with at all. And also what about the people who want to perform on the stages who also want and need accessibility? Like I'm prepared to spend the rest of my life working in equity theater and having to negotiate every single time in my contract that strobe lights cannot be used in any shows that I am in. And that is going to permanently mess up many job opportunities for me. It already has, solely because of a very teeny tiny accessibility thing. Also, for many people, relaxed performances tend to cause people who are seeing them to have meltdowns because they're loud and there's a lot of unpredictable noise from the audience. A theater is effectively signaling that this is an occasion when the people who want to shut out in the middle of a performance can, and that in some sense limits other people from coming. And to be fully transparent, I am one of those people. If I hear other people having a meltdown, I will almost immediately lose it. And some people on my team for my show are also the same way. So we've been going back and forth between like the ethical mission of how important relaxed performances are and the fact that we also cannot put on a show for people if our actors are having panic attacks on stage and we don't have a big enough space or sound design to have the stage sort of mute out those sounds and be disconnected from the audience. So look, we all know that overlapping access needs are a thing that exists. The question is, how can we navigate the groups of people who have these sensory needs but aren't bothered by any other aspect of theater? I have personally for a long time, 
been an aggressive proponent of lowering sound design volume by like five decibels and getting rid of strobes and lighting shining directly on the audience in mainstream theater. And you might be thinking, Sydney, that is absurd, but I raise you two points. One, from a directing perspective, if you're that upset about having to remove a very tiny and specific design choice, that means that you are not able to replace it with anything else. It has become a crutch for your design choices and that's an extra reason to get rid of it. You can do way cooler things and you're stopping yourself from being able to do those things because you are holding on to this way too much. Two, 10% of the population gets migraines. Migraineurs, people who get migraines, need to pay attention to epilepsy warnings too for our own survival. Um, for example, flashing lights and therefore not doing a very teeny tiny lighting change is potentially hurting one in 10 members of your audience. And if you, I don't know, went around and bonked a 10th of your audience on the head with like, I don't know, a brick during your show, people are gonna be mad about it. And you would figure out how to design your show without bonking people on the head with a brick. So that's also possible here. Yeah, there are also elements of relaxed performances that should just in general be added into mainstream performance as well. I think that every business in the world should start making very obvious visual stories on their websites. You also shouldn't be barred from getting back into a theater if you had to get up and leave for some reason. There should always be attention paid to extra space for service animals and wheelchair users. You should be allowed to bring in your own food and drink because, hi, I'm allergic to everything that they sell at theaters with the exception of hot pretzels if they don't put butter on them, which is rare. Um, but I also can't really go three hours without any calories or water and then there's the 45 minute drive to go to the theater on either side. So I'm always anxiously smuggling things in that I consume in the bathroom by myself during intermission. And that's weird. Um, trigger warnings are very sexy and the fact that they're not the norm is weird. Literally, why do shows need sense in their design and who did that? I will give an exception solely for waitress because they baked a pie in their lobby and that was different. Um, quiet spaces to escape to are super important and sensory kits to borrow for a show sound amazing and super easy to put together. All of these things would take maybe 15 to 20 minutes of effort per show or ever. Um, and they would mean that I could go to shows and I could enjoy them a million times more. I love the social situation of the theater. I love being able to go with somebody and sit in the darkness and watch a story play out live in front of me. It's very different from going to the movies and feel that creative energy. And I literally just want to do that with it being a teensy bit less loud, not having strobe lights and being able to have my water bottle. That's it. Relaxed performances are so cool. They're so important. And I especially love how it's introducing small kids to the arts. It's making it so that single parents with small kids can still go enjoy the theater. It's making it so people who never felt welcome there finally do. And it's also just a different way to look at theater. It's a different social norm. It's a different kind of theater. And it has made such a difference in the less than a decade, even way less than a decade um, that it has been around as a concept. I would just appreciate it if we didn't look at it as the solution to the accessibility issue and have it be the only option for disabled people. Because first of all, that's just not fair. Disabled people make up a full quarter of the population, but also as a creator and as an actor, the rigidity with which mainstream theater is holding on to these tiny little old traditions and is refusing to let them go, even the tiniest of bits, is frustrating and disheartening and uh, terrifying for job prospects and also not what I would expect from an art form that has been at the forefront of human development since the beginning, really. If you go into research about that, that is the case. And we keep talking about how theater is changing the world and how we are changing theater and all of this stuff. But the deeper into the field I go, the more I'm finding that it's a whole lot of talk and then not much is actually happening behind the scenes because people don't want to change things. But anyway, I hope that you learned something today. I've never actually been to a relaxed performance due to my access needs, but I would love to hear about your experiences if you've ever been to one. Um, I'd also love to hear about what access needs of yours you wish mainstream theater would make teeny tiny changes to meet. Um, and as always, thank you for listening. Thanks for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.